What's up, Recovered on Purpose family? Thank you so much for tuning in for this week's episode of Weekend Recap right here on the Recovered on Purpose show. We have a special guest tonight. Usually I do these on my own, but my good buddy Rob Lohman is coming in to bless the community with everything that he's up to. And guys, stick around. We're going to be talking about interventions, how to help addicts at their lowest. Love you guys so much. Enjoy the show. Keep living Recovered on Purpose. The black represents the darkness from which we came. The white represents the light in which we now live. And the red represents the passion it takes to live recovered on purpose. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for showing up for the Recovered on Purpose show weekend recap. Today, we have a special guest. My buddy Rob Lohman is here. Guys, make sure that you're sharing this out to your groups, to your pages. Get this message out. We're going to be talking about some things, how to help addicts at their lowest. So uh, sober since 2001 after a suicide attempt, Rob Lohman has helped thousands of people find freedom from substance abuse and feeling stuck in a rut to living a transformed life at liftedfromtherut.com. He does this through sharing his testimony, interventions, coaching, speaking, and being the host of both Beyond the Bars Radio and Addiction, Freedom, and Faith podcasts. Rob invests in the lives of those wanting to see positive change, whether it is coming out of addiction, prison, or just wanting more for their lives. He is a dynamic speaker who shares an extremely powerful journey of persistence, faith, and inspiration. Rob is also the author of the Addiction Intervention Book, and it's a number one bestseller in 14 different categories, as well as new release on Amazon. Guys, without further ado, my good friend, Rob Lohman. Rob, what's up, brother? Hey, 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 hey. It's just a beautiful day to be hanging out with you, Adam. Thanks a bunch, man. Amen, brother. I'm going to share this out to some groups right now. I'm doing uh, it right now, too, myself. So, <laughs> Man, it's been, it's, I don't know why, but I, but I usually don't even share this out. I just get right into it. So, Guys, if you're if you're here, let us know where you're coming in from. You're clean and sober dates because on the weekend recap, we are always celebrating with the celebration lights for uh, people that are. Well, I'm actually not even going to show you. If you're celebrating something, if you're celebrating a clean time, let me know in the comments so we can uh, celebrate with you. Good afternoon, Pam. Good to see you. Always good to see you. December. Thanks for being here. She said, "Welcome, Rob." Hey, thanks, thanks. Braxton, Adam, I got 43 days clean and feeling better than ever. Let's go. Celebration life for Braxton. Woo! Let's go. Let's go. 43 days. That's huge, brother. Amen. 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 December. We got January 18th, 2020. Amen. Amen. Let me keep sharing this a little bit. So, Rob, while I'm sharing it out, what are you up to right now? What are you oh, up to? Oh, man. Uh, well, first, hanging out here in Colorado. I love it out here. It's a beautiful day. Just, uh, you know, I love stories. I mean, that's why I do podcasting. That's why you share stories. We love seeing people's successes in their lives totally, totally change around. So what am I up to today, man? Um, I, I, I don't, there's just so much going on right now with the book that just came out and doing the swim for recovery thing and just, just loving on people and, you know, just, just seeing lives change left and right. And, you know, the coolest thing is like, you're getting messages from people that follow you. Right. And I love it. It's like, here's my day. What's up, Adam? Go. And, when I get text messages from clients and say, man, you, you're never going to guess what my son's doing now. Like he, he literally just got back with his kids. They got baptized and just hear these success stories. You're like, man, that's, that's why we do what we do. That's what it's about. That's what it's yeah. about. So uh, let's do a little bit of, of history. So on the show, you know, a lot of, most of the people that we're talking to right now, like both you and I usually talk to are either addicts struggling, addicts in recovery or loved ones of addicts. And what we like to do, we like to, you know, let them know we know what we're talking about. So tell us a little bit about your story, why it is that you do what you do, you know, and uh, yeah, let us know where you come from. Yeah, I feel I feel like I know what I'm talking about. I definitely have enough <laughs> lived experience. I mean, I found so- sobriety and recovery from substances 21 years ago. So June 8, 2001, yeah. the morning that morning of June 8, 2001, I was facing a 350 pound barbell to cross my chest and take me out of the game and uh, thank god that god intervened and divinely freed me from my addiction back then but it was mm. it, i mean you know 14 to 20 anybody watching you got your own crazy story right just insert crazy story right insert you know red and blue red and blue lights behind you insert jails insert suicide insert all those things and and that that's the journey i went from 14 to 29 and it was not not fun at all but i just i, I love recovery and that night you know when i was so desperate and decided to well not even it was it was subconscious you know as people with addictions i feel like we're driven by the subconscious so much yeah we don't even know what the heck's happening those lies and 
that you that you suck, you failed, all those things are going through our heads. And I was just haunted by how badly my life had turned out. Mm. And, um, you know, you, some people say, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, suicide and it was successful or it wasn't. I'm like, who cares? Like, I'm still here. But what it is, it woke me up and it took me to the rooms of recovery. And then I haven't had a desire to even think about drinking, drugging. It was just gone. Like I never even touched substances. Mm. And, but I, I know how hard that is for people that, that try like they're they're on the roller coaster ride they're 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 going they're going in and out of the you know what's that thing called <laughs> what goes round and round and you try to get off it but not yeah. the ferris wheel not whatever we're talking you know what i'm saying you're stuck yeah. you're stuck in the cycle and you get off and you get back on you get off you get back on and i'm grateful that wasn't my story but gambling stuck with me until three and a half years ago mm. and that that messed up my life pretty bad in recovery and i didn't even know it was messing me up so yeah, yeah we, all, we, all, we all have our cornucopia of addictions. Amen. Amen. And I think because I've had this discussion with other people, like um, if I will talk about or if I will help someone with porn addiction or sex addiction or gambling addiction and or food addiction and these things. And I have friends to send people to. Um, and there's it's a very similar part of the brain that or it's the same part of the brain, but it's a different physical reaction to the thing that we're addicted to. So, you know, I gambling, I've I've seen it affect a lot of people. It affected me for a part of my life. Um, you know, I'm glad you're out of it. Glad you're out of it. So yeah. what what did you do? You know, 21 years ago, you have this and I don't know if people miss this, but a 350 pound barbell that you were getting ready to kill yourself with. Right. Yeah. So what changed then and what did you actually do to find recovery? Yeah. <laughs> As you say that. We, I sit there and look at some of the things that if I really would have thought that out, that probably wouldn't have been my choice of, of using it at the end <laughs> of my life. Like, be, be like, man, well, look at that idiot. He was just trying to work out drunk. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I could have, I could have passed it off as that, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, just the amount of desperation stuff. And I, I totally forgot what your question was when you asked me just things. I went back to the bar, but what'd you ask me? <laughs> yeah. How'd you find recovery? Like what changed oh. when you were looking at that 350 pound barbell? And, you know, cause that was that the last time you drank? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it was one of those things that right before that I was hanging out in the bar that evening and I was so desperate and just crying out for help. Like I believe God hears our cries Amen. and just answers them when he's going to answer them. And he heard every single cry, every single plea for help, every single, like, just get me. I, and it was one of those things I never prayed the foxhole prayers. Like God, get me, get me out of this. I'll never do it again. Yeah. I was like, just get me out of this because I actually know I'm going to do it again. Mm. And, uh, but that night it was just different, man. And I was crying out for help and, um, and I was in the bar. So it was music, girls, everything just, you know, just kind of like, mm, 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 and it was, it was my scene. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the whole entire bar got completely dead silent. And I audibly heard the words you're done. And what I thought that meant was you're done drinking. Right. So I drive home. And it's kind of like, you know, I feel like something shifted, but it did. And I get home and the next thing I know, yeah, I got 350 pounds on a barbell crashing down on my chest. And what I believe happened that night, and this gets into the answer to your question, is that I feel like God kind of stopped time in a moment. Yeah. And he looked at my dog, Jake, and was like, go save your dad. Mm. You know, my dog comes over and he starts getting really close to close to me, uh, my knee and just starts nudging, nudging my head, my my knee with his head. And, and I looked at him. And I was just like, man, who's going to feed you tomorrow morning? And my, so my heart broke for my dog, which mm. I believe was God showing himself to me through my dog. And God carries the weight of the world. So I believe God was just sitting there like, okay, you done? All right, let's get, let's get done. Put that barbell back on the rack. And, and, and it's instant. I mean, every time I say it, I hear the metal hitting metal when I say that, you know, and it was just boom. Yeah. And, but I, I slept for peace the first time that night. So, so my heart shifted is what happened. Yeah. towards love for myself, I believe. And the next morning I called my mom and dad. I meant to call my aunt Carol because thank God for family members that are clean and sober that pursue you. Cause she had been sober 24 years at this time. And I accidentally called my parents hmm. and I cried and reached out for help for the first time. And my aunt came and picked me up and took me to a recovery meeting that day. And we parked on the front curb in Fort Wayne, Indiana, walked to the back of a bar yeah, back of the bar to my first AA <laughs> meeting, my recovery meeting. And there were people happy, joyous, and free. And I saw God on the wall, and that didn't scare me. And I was like, you know what? I'm in the right place. These guys are laughing, and last night I tried to kill myself. So I'm in. Yeah. And that's what that's all it took. I mean, I literally haven't had it. I didn't go through detox or withdrawal. 
I could drink two bottles of scotch to a couple of cases of beer in a day consistently for years. It just went away. And I just believe that I, in that small percentage of people, right, unfortunately, that that happens to the rest, it's a struggle and it sucks. And I, and my heart goes out for you guys. Um, and I literally just became Mr. Recovery. I mean, yeah. I joined, people say recovery is boring. You hear that a lot. I'm sure like, well, what am I going to do, Adam? People that are like, still well, using say that for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, this is a lot of fun. Like, I mean, right now I was joking with you before the show. My eyes are totally dilated right now because I went to the eye doctor today. Yeah. And I'm like, boom, big bug eyes. I'm like, I remember that guy. Oh, um, yeah. With bl- big, big bug eyes. But but I just, I, I heard what they did, you know, and I did what my, for, for my program, what my sponsor told me to do. He didn't tell me he suggested and one of the best questions he ever asked me was, hey, Rob, what makes you happy? Mm. Now, some of y'all try to answer that question in your head real quick, but what makes you happy? You can put it in the comments. Like, what makes you happy? Mm. And I said, without a, without hesitation, milkshakes. <laughs> and he said, all right, go get yourself a milkshake every day at 12 o'clock. So I did. I used that as an excuse to feed my sugar habit, um, which Amen. I think is probably America's number one addiction is uh, sugar, and carbs. The world. Sugar. Yeah. Yeah, the world. Yeah. And so, so that was it. I just became Mr. Recovery man and just stepped in and, and it, it so saddens me now with clients and people I work with and like, well, a a sucks or celebrate recovery stinks or I'm a sober softball and all this stuff. Like it's never going to work. I, you know, and I'm like, well, you're right. It's never going to work unless you try it. Yeah. And if you try it and it stinks, then dude, don't go do it again. Go do something else. But I just did everything. I went on sober camping trips. I became the whatever held some positions. That's what it has recovery. to be. And that's yeah. what it has to be. If people go into, you know, a meeting with a thought process that, you know, this is never going to work, you know, this guy's telling me to do it anyway. So I'm just going to go and I'm going to sit there and, you know, I'm going to basically have my ears closed while I'm sitting there. Right. Because this isn't going to work. If we go in with the with the you know perspective of anything to recover that it's not going to work, there's no use for it, you know, then then it's not going to work yeah. for me. Like like you said, you know, you just went all in. It didn't matter what I was doing in beginning in early stages of recovery. I was doing it all in. Everything I had was in order to recover from this drug addiction, from this, you know, this thing that was taking everything from my life. I just, that was all I wanted at that time. What was making, and the only thing, I can't even remember anything that made me happy at that time, except for like the thought of being in recovery. You know, I already had my relationship with God before. You know, I was building that relationship, but the thought, the hope of actually being recovered from drug addiction was like this crazy thought to me to work towards. Right. And in that, in that, at that time in my life, I had never completed anything, nothing. I had never completed a lease. I had never completed, you know, a promise, a, a coaching program that I did. Like I did coaching programs with like really high level coaches. And I was never able to complete anything because at some point I had to tell my coach, you know, I'm by the way, I'm banging heroin and I can't I can't keep true to this. You know, I can't afford you anymore because I have to put your money in my arm or whatever. And then the 12 steps were the first thing that I can remember since since I was young, very, very young, that I actually completed to the finish. And after that, it was almost as if like that was my first the 12 steps were my first step towards a new life and being able to set goals, being able to, you know, have a dream, have something that I want to attain, seeing the steps that I have to do to get there and then holding myself accountable and knowing that I actually can count on myself to do them. So anyone out there that is, you know, if you're still using, go into whatever recovery system you're going to do, whatever journey you're going to take, go all in. And anyone that's in recovery, we have the opportunity now to do the things we've always wanted to do. Again, what makes you happy, right? What makes you happy? So you talked a little bit about this, uh, this swim for recovery. Tell me what this swim for recovery is that you're doing. Oh man, this is so cool. So three weeks ago, I was swimming in the pool. So, um, swimming has always been part of my recovery and was part of my addiction, (laughs) right? Not the swimming was the addiction, but alcohol really impacted my swimming. So, uh, three weeks ago, I was literally swimming in the pool and it just, came to me in this thought of like swim for recovery. Mm. I didn't, I wasn't even thinking September's recovery month. It was just swim for recovery. I'm like, okay. So I went home and journaled about it and just thought about it. I'm like, what, what does this even mean? Yeah. And I thought, oh man, September swim for recovery. So if people go to swimforrecovery.com, what I'm doing is I'm swimming one mile a day 
to raise awareness for addiction and recovery in sharing one recovery story a day for people to just see it's possible. And we all have our different ways of recovery, but the bottom line is, like I said, these people all went all in for their recovery. And there's people that have like a year to 20 years to 40 years. I mean, the stories are awesome. So every day I'm going live on a bunch of different social media channels on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, um, what was the LinkedIn. Other one? I don't know. LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just, uh, I'll go swim at seven 45 in the morning for an, for, I don't know. I'm in the pool for like an hour. Cause I go to the hot tub and kind of relax a little bit, come home, fire up Streamyard, share someone's recovery story. And I'm just trying to create awareness, but also trying to raise funds to help people that cannot afford help people that need help mm. with sober living counseling or therapy scholarships and just support all the podcasting and stuff that I do um, like yourself, just out there being an advocate for people. So Amen. it's totally cool. And side result, I finally get to lose like that 15 pounds. Cause you're a pretty buff dude. You're in shape, you know, but I still got this little thing here that is like dad. You got the freshman 15. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And, um, and now I call it puppy bod cause we got a new puppy, but swim for recovery.com is where it's at. And, um, and it's a way to do that because, I mean, again, with the new book that came out, it's exciting and I love it. And it's opened up a lot of other doors, too. Uh, but Swim for Recovery is one of those things people can tap in, get immediate, kind of like, wow, awesome stuff. And yeah. use it like right now. And, they can, and even the tools in the book they can use, too. So, Amen. So just just for, uh, you know, for my sake, I guess, how many laps is a mile? Okay, so pick, picture a 25-yard pool. Okay, so it's I, just, I call it length. So people, some yeah. people say it's a lap. Some people say a laps down and back. It's 66 lengths, so down and back 33 times. So at the end of 30 days, will be 1,980 lengths of the pool, wow. 30 miles. And the th cool thing is, it was like when I was a kid, swimming was so important to me. It's what I did. That was my sport, swimming and soccer. Yeah. And we did these swim-a-thons to raise money for our swim clubs. And people would donate like a, a, a penny a mile or a penny a lap or 10 cents or a dollar a lap. So mm -hmm. I adopt that same philosophy now. See, because when I was a junior in high school, I made the state swim meet and I was a good swimmer. I don't know if I would have like gone to the Olympics or anything like that, but I was a really good swimmer and I was really proud of that accomplishment. But the problem was we were drinking at lunch every day and before practice. So senior year, I was like, man, I got to make a decision. Quit swimming, which I really love, or quit drinking, which I really love. <laughs> I think I'm going to quit swimming and screw the career and just continue to drinking and yeah man i, I never know what would have happened but um but so That's therefore yeah swimming and recovery i mean when you put and you know this when you put like potential and alcohol or addiction in the same room it's like alcohol or the addiction just kicks the crap out of potential every single time every time yeah. every time yeah i remember uh my my senior year of high school i had colleges recruiting me for both football and wrestling and I remember I even set a meeting with a college that I was going to meet uh, like in in high school. And after school, I literally just made the conscious choice that I'm just not going to show up. I'm not going to call them nothing. I'm going to go get high. Like who who in their right mind does that when someone is coming to pay for your college? You do right? that. <laughs> yeah. We do that. I this do guy. that. Yeah, this guy. And just so you know, in case it comes up later, but it's always, always good for engagement to show new puppies to oh. the people watching. <laughs> oh man. Sam, he's right down here. Hold on a second. Yeah, let's Hold let's see right the back. new puppy. Who wants to see the new puppy? <laughs> he's asleep, but I'll wake him up. Come here, Sam. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Okay, you ready? Are y'all ready for this? Let's see it. <laughs> there he is. Oh my goodness. Hi, baby. Oh, that's perfect. He literally just woke up. He's 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 uh nine weeks old and he's a little oh my goodness. He's Hi, like, buddy. Well, I've never had a small dog before, so this is really, really weird. Oh my goodness! Cute overload, cute yeah. overload. Yeah, three nights of no sleep. I'm pumped. <laughs> the blessing of recovery, bro. Just being able oh. to have a dog. Yeah, Gosh. totally. And feed it and let it pee and poop yeah. outside the house. Amen. And bro, yeah. uh, I left Aaron's Aaron's comment up because he is a uh, he's in Australia. He shows up basically every live, and he professionally scuba dives does scuba diving swimmer and uh photography and everything and he actually is just uh he's getting his son he found out 10 years later that his ex-girlfriend didn't tell him about a son and he's actually being awarded the son right now and he's in the process of getting him so and he's, he's coming up on two years clean and sober you know living a new life and just super proud of you brother thanks for always being here 
That is awesome. Congratulations, Amen. Aaron. Yeah. Amen. Purpose oh. on purpose. Amen. What's up, Jennifer? Don't run away from heavy emotions. Honor the anger. Give pain the space to breathe. This is how we let go. Amen. Love you too, Jennifer. I know. I know. This is these are the comments about the puppies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. His name's Sam. He, you can pray for Sam. And he has a is the other dog we have is 80 pound labradoodle. So we got 80 pounds and five pounds right now. So Aww, yeah. so cute. All right. So what's up with this book? You're I know that you do um you know, interventions and we all, what my, what my understanding of an intervention was before I met you, what a lot of people, you know, have this, um, this idea of it is, is from the show intervention, right? Where, where they follow around someone that's in their addiction and they tell them they're just doing a documentary about their story. And then at the end of the show, they lock them in a room with their family and tell them, you know, if you don't go with them, you're cut off. We're never talking to you again. Right. So how does that how does that fare for what you do? <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. This is I'm gonna show people the book. This is why I wrote this book called the Addiction Intervention Book. Adam, you can get one in Australia because it's global. Um, but if you go to Amazon, you can look it up. And the reason I wrote it is because there are many, many different ways to help somebody through an intervention. Yeah. So many ways that I actually interviewed 10 other professionals in the back of the book that are, have their own chapter in the book on how they how they help people and so there's all these different ways different modalities all these things and i just say we need to use whatever way is going to do, be the best for whoever we're dealing with yeah. right because there's not one way but the one thing i want to say is you hear a lot of people say well we're just going to wait till so and so hits hits their bottom we're going to wait till they crash and burn and we're going to wait maybe they just need to get a dui or lose the kids or lose their job well we know a lot of that has happened to a lot of people i had a lot of stuff on my own journey that was pretty crazy. But here's my philosophy on interventions. Really plain and simple. Are you ready for this? This is it. We're going to yeah. simplify it. I'm in the business of bringing the bottom up to your loved one and the family instead of you having to crash and hit the bottom. Yeah. That's Amen. my whole philosophy in it. That's what I want to do. So what does that look like? Well, for me and what I do is it's kind of a different approach. I would say I kind of talk myself out of business sometimes because families will sometimes call and say, you know, so and so, or my husband needs my husband needs to get sober. He's ruined the family. He's going to lose his job, and it's just all about berating the husband. Yeah. And I ask him a simple question sometimes, and this isn't always the case, but I'll say, "Well, have you ever asked Rob if he wanted to get sober?" No, I just know he needs to. And it's there's never yeah. an ask, a real heartfelt ask. It's just from attacking and blaming and just yelling and stuff. So I say, "Hey, why don't you just ask him?" Say, "I met this guy named Rob." Pretty cool dude. Got a crazy story. I don't know how to help you because we fight every time we talk about it. So are you willing to go have coffee with him? Okay. That's opportunity number one for someone to step into an opportunity to sit down with me and talk. Yeah. Right. Says no. Then we can invite him to an intervention and say, hey, family's confused. We don't know how to help you anymore. We're really scared for you. We're having a meeting with this guy named Rob on Tuesday at four. Would you please show up? Because we want to talk about some options. He's a pretty smart guy. He knows what's going on. We're hoping you'll be there. Yeah, that's called like an invitational intervention ish. And it's like, yeah, shows up. Cool. We have a great conversation. It's more uh, you know open to the idea of getting help. And then there's the other end of kind of like more of an extreme intervention where it is kind of waiting around the corner in our cars, having coffee at Starbucks, talking about what's the strategy. OK, we're getting ready to go over there like he's awake. He's having eggs or he's still asleep. OK, here's the plan. And I know there's going to be like four audibles called the whole day because it gets kind of crazy and we just show up. Yeah. And we're there unannounced, has no clue it's even happening, right? But here's the great thing is when he or she comes up and they're up there and, you know, they're kind of like, okay, uh, hi, Uncle Dave. Um, and who are you? And and I get to introduce myself and they're, sometimes it's like, well, who the, get out of my house, you know? And I'll say, well, I, I get that. I understand that. I'm only going to be here for a few minutes just to let you know, like your family invited me to come over because they love you so much and they're concerned. And it's like, well, how do you understand? I'm like, well, let me tell you my quick story. Yeah. 14 years drug. Blah, 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 blah. And by the way, I've been to prison and all this great stuff. And I understand what you're going through to an extent. So let's just have a conversation. Yeah. And so it's a whole plethora, but that's why I wrote the book was really to help um, families understand there's, there is a way to help their loved one. They don't have to crash and hit bottom. 
yeah. to the point of a therapist or a counselor that has no clue how to use an intervention to the interventionist that watched the TV show, which, hey, it's a great show. It's entertainment, you know, but that's not the way they're all done. And yeah. to give interventionists an idea of how to be better at Amen. what they do. So it's kind of you know, a plethora I've, to hit people. I've I've looked into it. I've read read a lot about it. And the actual show intervention, because I used to get high and watch that. And I think December was saying I used to watch that show drunk. Yeah, I and, saw that post. Yeah. You know, that show did more to harm our community than it did to do good. Because the, the whole, you know, cut the addict off, it doesn't it doesn't help us. It really it really doesn't help us. And there's there's a point where, you know. We call this compassionate intervention, right? Like there's there's a way to intervene with an addict without telling them you're no longer going to love them, without telling them you're no longer going to be there for them, you know, and there's there's a way to talk to them and help them through the process with boundaries around yourself. Because that's the number one thing. Like when I'm when I'm talking to when somebody hits me up and they're a loved one of an addict, right? And I'm and I'm talking to them. The number one thing that I check on first is their well-being. Because the well-being of someone of the loved one of an addict is more important than it is the well-being of the addict in that moment. Yeah. Because if the loved one of an addict is coming into a space of like, he's done this and he's done this and, you know, coming in with all this hate and energy and everything. And he's harming me in this way. And he's doing all these things to me, you know, then there's no way that that energy is going to be brought into helping this person because all they feel in that moment is all of that hate and harm that they've caused. They're just like, I just want to get away from that. The only way that I know how to get away from that drugs and alcohol, yeah, drugs and alcohol and separating from you. But if that person's healthy, you know, okay, what are you doing to work on your life? I literally have this conversation with with mothers, with uh, with spouses or significant others of addicts. Like, what can you do right now to live in your best your best self while this is going on over here? Right. How what is it that you want to do with your life? I've talked to people about, you know, and what comes out is they'll blame the addict for, you know, their unhealthy habits of eating or their inability to go to the gym because they're so stressed out about the addict so they can't get their habit back in, in line. They're so stressed out about the addict that they can't do this. They don't think that they can go to school because they're worried about the addict the whole time. And I'm like, hey, all of those things, right? If you start doing all of those things and you stop resenting the addict for taking them away from you, you're going to be in a way better situation to stand up and say something, yeah. you know? And, and they're not going to feel like they're, tearing everything away from you in that moment when you come to help them, right? What do you what do you think about the you know the importance of the loved one of an addict being healthy themselves, you know? Oh yeah, 100%. And and that's usually when the phone call comes in, I always try to slow the train down a little bit and kind of hear more of what's going on. And cuz yeah. I won't just say, "Okay, yeah, let's do an intervention and jump into it right off the bat." I'll say, "Hey, let's just get more of a history. Let's talk about and some of it we try to get into kind of their part in a way of the relationship." in yeah. that first call and just kind of say, okay, now, cause I'm really big on the family plugging into the intervention process. If they're not willing to, there are times I haven't even taken a family on because they just want me to go get him or her fixed. Yeah. And I'll say, yeah, I understand. And, and they need a, a fixed cause we're not really broken. I mean, we're broken, but you know what I mean? We're not like a, a toaster that's that we just going to change some knobs and be good. Yeah. So with the family, I just say, no, look, I understand that. And I know you've been there kind of like most of the journey and he's been there. She's been there most of the journey. So my goal is to talk to the entire family who would be a part of the intervention. And I'll, and I'll let you know kind of who's going to be a part of it and not because I've uninvited people because they're going to be toxic. They're going to come in with that attitude, Adam. Of, yeah. They're going to come in ready to just swing and box. I said, this is not family therapy. Right. All we are wanting to do is for you family to buy into getting some help and your loved one to say yes to getting help. Yes. Right. Because yeah. they, because they can, and, and so in the process, what I do is I literally, my first step in what I do with lifted from the rut interventions is we're just going to listen with love. That's the first thing is I'm just listening with love or out judgment. None of that because what I'm teaching them in the beginning is that we're going to do the same thing to your loved one. When we meet with them, mm. we're going to listen with love. So it's kind of this, process in the beginning i start and say what we just did is what we're going to do with your loved one yeah because they don't really want to be doing what they're doing 
anyway. They just yeah. don't know how to get out. And if they do want to keep doing what they're doing, it's because they're listening to the lies in the head that you suck, you failed, you'll lose, you may as well die. No one cares about you. You're invisible, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff that keeps us in our addiction sometimes. Yeah. Amen. And guys, we're going to take a quick 30 second break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the success of interventions, the success of the show interventions, and how we can bring this into our own lives with the loved ones. Go What's back. up, Recovered on Purpose family? I hope you're enjoying this episode as much as I do when I'm making them. Guys, if you're getting any value from this, if you're seeing any golden nuggets that you want to share with your community, make sure that you are. You're sharing it with your groups, you're sharing it with your personal page or your pages, or to that one person that you're thinking of right now and their messengers so that they get this message. And guys, the brand new Recovered on Purpose website is up, and it has a whole bunch of different uh, merchandise and resources and the free calls with me. So make sure you're checking out recoveredonpurpose.com after the show. And if you are a loved one of an addict, if you have a kid that's suffering an addiction, I'm now doing free calls so we can strategize and find out how we can get them clean and keep them clean. Love you guys so much and enjoy the rest of the show. All right. So someone set up here, Anna set up here, that that show was so triggering for me. I watched it though because I did get to see changes come from so from some of those people, and it gave me a little hope, but didn't take me anywhere near close to getting clean because all of the using. Yeah, so there was actually, you know, and you can Google this yourself, I don't have the exact numbers on hand, but there was much closer to 0% success for the for that show with long-term recovery than there was to 25%, much closer to 0%. Because even the ones, you know, even the ones that went, right, they didn't go because they decided that they wanted to. They didn't go because they were talked into an internal decision to go. And that's the number one first step for finding recovery. You have to admit and have the desire to stop, period. Am I, am I right, Rob? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it starts with desire. I mean, you can be forced to do all sorts of things, but if you don't want it, it ain't going to work. Yeah. And if you're telling an addict that's that's in their addiction, like if you would have came to me, you know, at certain points in my addiction and told me, you know, especially with my family, if my family would have circled around and done an intervention with me and told me that they're no longer going to talk to me if I don't go, they are not going to love on me anymore if I don't go, you know, and they're going to cut me off if I don't go. I'm going. I'm going. I, I'm I'm well aware that 30 days I can ugh, if I'm locked away, I could probably make it 30 days. But day 31, I'm I'm banging. And then I'm like, I'm like, it's probably gonna be cheaper for me for a little bit because my tolerance will be so low. That would be my thinking before I went. So the, the odds of that happening are are slim to none. So in these conversations that you're having with these with these addicts and alcoholics in the intervention. Are you instilling that that desire in them? Because I know that, you know, like the founding founding fathers of recovery, right? Bill and Bob, the way that they would do it. And when Ebby came in the first time with Bill, he sat down and all he did was told the story. That's all he did. And that's where the desire started. The hope started. And what they did was they would go and they would tell their story. And that's it. They would find out if somebody had the desire just by sharing their story. So is that what you've been noticing by sharing your story do they start to you know get that desire themselves yeah i mean once they realize i'm a guy that's been through a lot of stuff myself and that's why i love like the coffee conversations right because it's not this whole orchestration but but the great thing is though in that setting where we do you know kind of orchestrate if you will an intervention and we approach it from this place of love you know people do write letters you know in most of them but the letters are so powerful and moving that what it does is it stirs the person's heart to want to change. They're not conf confrontational. They're not in their face. But my one of the phrases I use a lot when I'm talking to someone is I said, when was the last time that you invested in yourself? Mm. I say, forget what your mom wants, your dad wants, your brother, your boss. I said, when was the last time you invested in yourself? Mm. And, and it's this head tilt thing of like, what do you mean? So great question. So, <laughs> and we get, we get into our, cause I mean, one of the best interventions I did, it was so much fun. You know, the family was real worried and it was all this stuff. And it was, you know, we're like, you know, kind of one of those things where, you know, um, kind of like we're hiding in the bathroom and just kind of waiting to come out and she was there and all this stuff. And it was just, well, I don't know if this is going to work. And I said, Hey, just trust the process. Yeah. Just trust. And I'm looking at her and, and I just said, um, are, are, 
what well, I'm trying to think of the exact words, but something like, "Aren't are, are you sick and tired yet of just playing the game?" Mm. And she looked at me and just she looked around the room and just started bawling. She goes, "I need help." And her yeah. family just stepped back. We didn't read a letter yet. We didn't do anything. She stepped back and just thought, "What just happened?" Yeah. No one had ever asked her that before because it was always darts and targets. Like mm. you did this, and, and, and it was just like. Yes. I mean, but 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 then again, the family can say those same things and, and then it from it doesn't struggle with it. And then I can walk in or you can walk in and just say, And here's my story. Like, don't you want to get off the roller coaster? Yeah. How many times have you wanted to get off the roller coaster and just couldn't? Oh, every day, dude. Well, what if you could get off it today for good? You know, what if you could Let's get off go, it today please. for good? <laughs> yeah. And and so it's it's kind of asking the right questions and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, yeah. all those good things. So I have a, I have a peep a, a person peeping in my door here. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna tell my son he can come grab the dog. So come cool. grab the dog, Zeke. It's uh, <laughs> that's that, they don't care about me anymore. They care about the dog. And um, <laughs> but speaking of dogs, you know, oddly enough, you know, Adam, that's one of the biggest objections people have sometimes. Like, what about my dog? And we can get into like all the objections I hear from people. But what about my dog? He needs me here. Hmm. And then and and the question I'll ask sometimes as well. Let me ask you this. If you're drunk and high and not and going to the bar and sleeping in stuff, I said, are you really here? What, how great would it be that you could go invest in yourself and your dog could like be ta- well taken care of? And when you get back together, you're both really healthy and then you can do all sorts of cool things. Right. Amen. And so it's just, it's meeting where meeting where people are. Yeah. And in the intervention, I mean, they're all different. It's that's the fun thing about them is just, you don't know what you're going to get. The stoic dad that's never cried. It's bawling in the intervention and the family's looking at what just happened. So we cracked the heart open, man. And yeah. so getting, I mean, there's this whole process I take people through, through the intervention and uh, um, which again, I know you're a big book guy. You know, when you write a book, you're kind of putting everything on paper and it has to be articulated well. Right. Yeah. And it forced me to really articulate well, what are the steps when I do interventions with people? And so it was, it was really kind of cool all of it kind of really coming together. So, um, yeah. So just meet people where they are, crack the heart open, get them to invest in themselves, not worry about mom or dad or anyone thinks. And I mean, I've kicked, I kick parents out of the intervention. Sometimes I've kicked the whole family out of intervention. I said, Hey, it's just time for me and Adam to talk. Yeah. And I prep them for that. I say, Hey, there might be some really weird things I do, but just trust the process. Yeah. And uh, those conversations are a lot of fun. Just one-on-one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, I, I haven't I haven't dove into the the whole intervention space yet. I've gotten asked to get into that space. I've gotten asked to, you know, do interventions on this person or this person or this kid. And I'm just like, man, it's it seems like a a very consuming path. Like if you're doing interventions, it would be you're doing interventions. That's like the path that you're taking in our community to help people. And I've had to say, I've had to say no to certain paths in our community while doing this. Like I've been asked to do marketing for treatment centers. I'm like, you know, I I just can't do it because there's no treatment center with the success rate of, of what I, what I talk about. You know, I talk about something that if someone does it exactly how I talk about, they're going to recover every time. It is absolutely impossible to do exactly what I did, exactly how I did it and not recover. It just never happens. I just took someone, a a girl that had, uh, she had, you know, I met her on her day one in her first ever meeting. And then I didn't see her again for a couple months because I wasn't going to that meeting. I wasn't, you know, I was doing a lot of this. And uh, then I see her again and she's on day like 60 something, 70, right around there. Awesome. But she hasn't done a step yet. And she's like, letting me know, you know, I'm like, I'm worried about relapsing. I I think that if I do this, I'm going to relapse. And I'm like, you know, and bro, in this meeting, before she told me any of that, God told me, you need to take her through the steps. You need to take her through the steps, you know? Mm. And this past weekend, I took the whole weekend off schedule from morning to night, Saturday and Sunday, met with her and did all the first nine steps, the first eight steps and the beginning of ninth step. And bro, what happened in that work, she had never 
actually believed in God before doing this work. In the first day, she was crying and said that she fully believed in God now. That's that's the power of someone picking a path, right? And giving it their all in helping an addict struggling. Because us, us that are doing this and this and this and this, this path, and maybe this, and maybe our opinion over here and our opinion over here. If we're doing that and not going all in with what we know to work, it's it's never gonna work. Yeah. If we're if we're taking bits and pieces from all these different things, it's not gonna work. We have to talk about what worked for us and do that and do it with everything we have. Yeah. And I really appreciate that you are that you're doing what you're doing because man, it was something it's something that I have thought about, but I'm just I'm just not ready to step into it because I know are the, is there quite a bit of heartache in there also? What are you experiencing with that? Yeah, you know, if, when it first got started, I, I had a hard time when people said no or a hard time when family members and just didn't work out technically, you know, and then yeah. and I just realized it's not I'm not I'm not responsible for the results. I'm just going to bring the right tools and strategies and and teach people. And and so that in, in a sense, in, along the way, yeah, there's always heartache when people say no. There's mm -hmm. heartache when because people will say, and I love this question when families call me, they'll say, well, Rob, there's two things that come up. Um, well, three things. One, Rob, we're a Christian family. We know you're a Christian. We love that. We'd love to use you. Cool. Because I'm kind of like outspoken about my faith, which when I wrote the book, it was kind of like, okay, God, I'm throwing it out there. It's not coming back. Like people know. And, and, uh, and but like 45% or so of families that use me know I'm a Christian. And they say, we're not, but we still want to use you because we hear you're good. And we want to hire you. Cool. Right. And then the third one um, along the way is what's your success rate? Because there yeah. are people that post success rates. 92. I know one guy has 100 percent success rate in interventions. Everyone he's ever worked with has gone to treatment and everyone has been successful. I'm like, you know what? I, I don't have any arrogance or pride. or anything. It's just like I, I, I don't have a success rate. But here's what I tell people. Kind of like what you just said. If you do the things that work. You will have success, whether you're the family that learns about healthy boundaries and, you know, you know, loving them in their recovery, not in their addiction. And or it's the loved one that goes to treatment and does all the work and the family does nothing because I tell families when they say, well, that program didn't work. And, as you know, there's a lot of crappy programs out there, but there's also a lot of good ones. When I hear that program didn't work, I'll say, well, let's talk about that. Well, how was their family program? What? What do you mean family program? OK. One reason why it probably didn't work. Um, and then just asking them questions down along the way, you know, well, did your loved one engage in treatment or did you were able to talk? And so, well, I mean, they said the groups were okay. And, and then you find out the loved one never, ever even opened up about their traumatic past. So right. it just matters on what you do. And so it's all up to people's success rate. Their success is what they put into it. Like you said, Amen. if you're going to do, if you're going to do steps one through four, and forget the rest of them. Well, how do you really, how do you really plan to change your life when you're not doing things that really do work? Now, granted, twelve steps may not be for everybody, right? Celebrate recovery might be for somebody. Or I walk people through the steps to freedom in Christ, and they yeah. find well, they get all sorts of crazy relief. So, desire and commitment are key for the family and the loved one. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And there's, you know, there's things that I, per, I personally. Yeah, and I love that too. Yeah. <laughs> you planted seeds. You're a sobriety farmer. Yeah, Let's girl, go, go. plow Let's those plow those fields. And I and I threw up some uh, some celebration lights for my boy Richard from uh, October 28th, 2019, in Linwood, Washington. Let's go, bro! Congratulations. And you know, um, when we are when we are talking about the different paths of recovery, right? And when I'm talking to someone about this works, if you do this exactly how I did it, it works 100% of the time, right? And the people that don't do it, it's interesting because I, I'm fully faithful in God, 100% believe that God directs people to recovery and directs them into and through recovery. If my message telling someone that doesn't come across to them where they're like, well, I need to do that. Perfect. I'm not changing my message about what works 100% of the time when I do it with someone, then, then that, that's good if they're not going to go with me. But the thing is, is that more people talking to that person, more 
recovery farmers out there, you know, more sobriety farmers out there sharing their path exactly how they did it, though. Not these like little nitpicky things from everybody else's recovery journey, you know, that might work for them. You have to share what actually worked for you because the person that is supposed to hear your message and follow your path, it will hit them in the heart in that moment. It'll hit them in the heart. And there's certain things that, you know, I personally didn't experience that have worked for people that I'm not necessarily an advocate for, but I'm absolutely pro MAT. I'm, I'm, I'm pro medically assisted treatment. I, I will never tell somebody they're not in recovery because they're on Suboxone. My, and the reason why my experience with that, my best friend, I met him in his first week of recovery and he was bottom like me, heroin, meth, homeless, all that. And he did Suboxone for his first three years of recovery in those first three years. Uh, he bought his first house, started a business. We worked together for a little while. He built my first recovered on purpose website. And I was, I was able to be the best man at his wedding. He just had his first son and he stopped the Suboxone after the first three years. Now, am I going to tell people that Suboxone isn't, isn't recovery because I have some kind of pride and arrogance that I got off a of heroin without it? No, no. And am I going to tell somebody that, you know, they have to do it this way or it's not going to work or, you know, and if anybody out there is judging people for the way that they are recovering, you are part of the problem. And we are called in our recovery to be part of the solution, period. Yeah, right? like, like you said, you tell people how you work with them. And if they don't want that, then you're not the right guy for them, right? So yes. people know what you're about. Say, hey, man, there's there's multiple pathways to recovery. If this if this doesn't jive with, if, if, if this isn't resonating with you, then I'm not your guy. And yeah. there's a bunch of other people here. So go check out this guy. And then that's why we know lots of people in the industry because like, hey, that might work for them as well. And um, I'm reading that comment right there. And it was like those three words, feelings, emotions, and thoughts. Yeah. What what were those when we were drinking and drugging? <laughs> I wasn't connected to any of those things. But um, <laughs> I hear what you're saying, girl. Or Jer it's Jeremy, sorry. Yeah. I Again, my eyes are dilated, so I can't read terribly well. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> yeah. So he's uh, he's talking about in recovery now. Yeah, yeah. He's talking oh, yeah. about in recovery. Yeah, and in recovery, yeah. those all things come back, and we get to feel them and work through them and understand them. And like, it's okay to feel like I, I love. I'm an emotional kind of guy. I mean, my kids and stuff will be like, "Dad, you all right?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm just thinking about so and so." I'm okay. Me too. Bro. It's okay. <laughs> Me, too. <laughs> Me too. But man, I'm I'm blessed because I even in my addiction, starting in I think. Uh, late 2015 to early 2016, I started journaling, even even in my addiction. And going back to those thoughts, going back to those emotions that I was having at that time, what I would do is I would whenever I would wake up in the morning, I had a journal next to my bed. And I did uh, what was called morning pages, I learned it in, uh, oh, my gosh, the way of the uh, artist way, artist way. And you just write out your thoughts for three whole pages, you have to write three whole pages next to your bed and i would date the top of the page bro and going back to those journals and seeing where my mind was at in addiction right compared yeah. to now oh my goodness oh my goodness it's uh i was not in as much control of them as i am now i'll just i'll just say that right i was going through a lot <laughs> oh yeah i'm gonna turn my camera around because i have this nice backdrop behind me but here's what my office really looks like so over there on that table, all right. I pulled out my I pulled out my prison box a couple nights ago. Your just prison box. What the prison yeah. box? So I was I was gearing I was gearing up for this um for the uh swim for recovery kind mm -hmm. of month, and I wanted to really kind of reflect on when I was in prison and all the cards and all the letters that people wrote to me. And so I just started mm -hmm. reading them. You know, and I was reading my journal entries. I mean, I've got a bunch of these like right here by my desk now that I'm kind of going back through each day this month. And I'm reading these things. And I'm just like, man, I don't remember writing that at all. And it was like total God download, right? And, I'm, and I'd read things. I'm like, oh, I remember reading that because I was pissed off that day. I was angry at some stuff. And just be able to process that. But my whole desk over there. So I'm going to throw this. I don't know why this is kind of coming out of my mouth here. But 
hey, if you have friends or people in prison and in, in jail and stuff, write them letters. Mm. I'm like reading through my cards for the whole family was gone that night a couple nights ago, and I'm just weeping at my table. I'm weeping at the fact that I missed my Aunt Carol's funeral because I was in prison, mm. and she was like my mm. second mom. She got me in the rooms of recovery. I was so I was so heartwarmed by all the letters my cousins wrote me and said, you know, we're really sorry you're not here. We know you want to be here. We love you. And I was just like weeping that if my family would have walked in, they would have wondered what was wrong with me. But it was mm-hmm. a true, authentic elephant here. So I was feeling those emotions, right? And yeah. and those feelings that um, Jeremy posted about. And but that's like my table recently. That I just I sort out the cards, and I had I had like forty business, forty birthday cards sent to me in prison. And these guards are like, "Who the hell are you? <laughs> like who gets four, <laughs> who gets forty birthday cards in prison? What are you doing here, bro?" I go, yeah. yeah, I know it sucks. Like, um, it's been a journey, but th- th- thanks for not, you know, labeling me as a guy that should be here. But, right. but all those things and, and, and those, I mean, yeah, I mean, I went to prison in recovery, but yeah. it's okay because I found out who I was, and uh, it's we got to figure out who we are, man. It's the identity piece of who we are. That's that's even that's step three of lifted or step two lifted from the right interventions is identity, identifying mm. who we are, identifying the problems, and addressing those. But. It's a gift to help people. Like, and, and, and you said something earlier I want to touch on that was really important that is, is our hearts are geared to helping so many people. We can do too many things that distract us from the purpose God has in front of us. Yes. You yes. Know, and I, I, I wish I were, I don't even, I, I haven't been journaling lately, so this might inspire me to start journaling again, but I was sitting around once and, and as I'm coming up with some different coaching programs, you know, mm-hmm. I was looking at what everyone else is doing. <clears throat> And I had all these things. I'm like, oh, this is what this place does. I like that thing. And like you said, taking little bits and pieces. I was like, you know what? Stop it. I took it all and threw it in the trash. And I was like, God, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Get back to what is God calling me to do that's unique about me and what I've been through and how God yeah. has wired me to help people. And it was so refreshing, man, Ooh. to just take all that. I just threw it all in my trash can. And I was like, yeah. All right, God, let's get back to business. Um, what you really called me to do, not what's working for somebody else. Because guess what? I ain't somebody else. I'm me <laughs> and I'm Dude. unique and I have so much to offer people. And and I do that already. It was just, I got distracted by, Oh, that guy's, that guy's doing really well over there. What's he doing? Yes. You know, or I need a cool studio like Adam. I'm going to go spend $10,000. <laughs> this was not $10,000, bro. I'm but, in, you know, I'm you, in you, Columbia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got it on a, I got it on a 10% discount, bro. <laughs> like, like, you got the clickable lights. Like I mean, 10% of a yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like to the comparison thing, right? So if you're in recovery, yeah. man, just embrace recovery. You're where, right where you are, but you can't stay there and yeah. find someone that's going to help you move forward. You know, whether, you know, wh- whatever it is, I mean, you're, you're here now. I mean, I was looking at the Facebook thing and it was, I mean, there's so many comments right now on this stream because you're, you, you've done a great job, Adam, of encouraging people. Man, the people so that show recognize up, you for that. I, I appreciate you saying that, but the people that show up to this, like if you look at the comments, everybody's here for everybody else. They're, yeah. they're lifting each other up They're This community that's, that's here. They, they want to be here to lift each other up. This isn't about me. It never has been about me. I think people have recognized that. And they, I love this community, bro. Like there's, there was one post once, right? One post once that was, it was, um, you know, find, find a partner that loves God more than you. Right. And all of a sudden it went viral. It got like two, three, 4,000 shares, but the comments, bro, all the comments were negative. Like, talking crap about God. Yeah. Have an imaginary friend and all this different stuff. So the Facebook algorithm caught on to that, right? Caught on to that. And it was interesting to see because a few people, like I know Jeremy was in there. I know Brittany was in there and a few different people, you know, ended up seeing it, but Facebook was pushing it to all these different people. And it was just really interesting to see the difference from one post to every other post that I ever do of people in this community, just lifting each other up. Wow. That's all I ever see here. Nice. And that's why I'm I'm passing it off to you guys. I appreciate you saying that, brother. And I just, I pass it off to you guys. And thank you for being here. And you said something, bro, that I had to write down because I'm going to journal on this later. And I think everybody that's listening right now, you should write this question down and journal on this later. What is unique and special about me 
that call, that God called me to do? What is, because something in this tattoo on the back of my neck, right? It's, it's an Aquarius sign and I got it, you know, kind of mysteriously to have that, but I got it because it's also the approximate sign approximately equal to. I got it right before I got sober. And it was because when I was going into the, all the fellowship meetings, everyone was like, you're the same as everybody else. And you're the same as everybody else. You're just an alcoholic. You're just an addict. And all these messages are coming at me. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm beautifully and wonderfully and uniquely made by God. And I'm aware of that. I know that's true. So when I'm walking into these meetings, I don't want to hear that I'm the same. I want to hear that I have the same disease. Yeah. That we all have a common solution to, but I'm not the same. I'm, I'm approximately the same, right? And when I, when I understood that, that we in this community, we have a common problem. Many of us have a common solution. And if we came together and we strengthened each other in our strengths, right? That would make it so that the body would work better as a whole together. If we weren't cutting people down for weaknesses, or we weren't trying to trying to fix our weaknesses because this person over here is really good at that thing. If we all focused on what we were really good at and what we were really called to, you know, we could help a lot of people, a lot of people. Yeah. So Rob, where can people, I'm going to write this so that people can see it, but where can people find you? Where's the best place to find you right now? I'm going to write the website down. Uh, best thing is liftedfromtherut.com in general but for september if you're watching this in september right now go to uh, swimforrecovery.com it's a lot of fun it's really cool and totally stoked so swimforrecovery.com is the most fun thing happening right now and yeah. um, i was going to show you this real quick so pictures are worth what a thousand words right yeah v lives are worth i think 10 million words but mm. but you look i'm going to show you this picture and Look at how we're um, smiling and all, like happy go lucky. Like, these are my my wife and kids. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's when I was in prison. Aww. <laughs> and I look at this picture every day. I'm like, yeah, we're smiling, right? And we're enjoying quality time together while all these guards are watching. And it was, you know, angel tree. Oh, that was that, in prison. That was in prison. Oh, wow. And I have this picture from in prison. I'm looking at that. I'm just like, it's just my reminder that no matter where we are in any journey in our life, anything we're doing that we, it's important to just em, kind of embrace where we are. Right. Yeah. And look at what the lessons to be learned are, because I remember in that conversation right there, my wife was wanting to talk to me about, you know, the finances and the situation and stuff. And I'm like, there's guards, there's cameras, there's microphones. Like I'm not going to talk real here, but the picture, yeah. we look so happy. And, um, but in, but in that, you know, if you're away or you're struggling, uh, people love you out there, no matter what you've done or what you're doing or where you're going. And you find a community like this or a community that can build you up is so huge because the, the shaming, toxic communities, just they don't help people move forward a lot of times. Amen. Amen. So that's what we're here for, guys. Uh, we love you so much. Rob, thank you for coming and blessing the community. Keep up the good work. I'm going to have this banner up you guys can find him at lifted from the rut.com and this month is really good for swim for recovery.com uh for the you know mile a day and story a day challenge so guys check rob out rob thanks so much for being here guys we love you we love you very much keep up the good work have an amazing weekend and keep living recovered on purpose <laughs>